Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, there are reports this morning from a leaked document that Glasgow City Council are considering cutting 800 teaching posts. The General Secretary of the SSTA Teachers Trade Union said this would potentially write off the current generation of young people. So was the First Minister aware that an SNP-run council was considering such a drastic cut in teacher numbers? First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, this of course is that time of year uh, when we get lots of reports about savings options that different councils are considering and opposition parties quite understandably make hay with that, but very often these proposals do not proceed. And I think the official report of this Parliament will be littered of example, with examples of what I've just uh, spoken about. In terms of these particular proposals, I've not seen the detail of these. Uh, councils, of course, are autonomous in their areas of responsibility, something uh, that parties across this chamber often call on the Scottish Government to respect. But as my record shows, and indeed as my government's uh, funding to councils demonstrates, uh, I am in favour of more teachers, not fewer teachers. <coughs> Douglas Ross. Well, the First Minister's record is 900 fewer teachers in Scotland, so I'm not sure how her rhetoric matches uh, her record. And she's, she's saying, I, I'm standing here making hate. No, I'm not. I'm deeply worried that one of the biggest councils in Scotland is considering 800 teachers being lost. If Glasgow City Council went ahead with that, it would re reduce school staff by 15%. One in seven teachers in Glasgow would be lost. And we've heard reports that SNP-run East Ayrshire Council is also considering cutting teachers. East Renfrewshire is contemplating very serious cuts to education. This is what happens when the SNP don't properly fund councils. It wastes taxpayers' money on ferries that don't float and other pet projects instead of providing Scottish education and Scottish schools with the support they need. So will the First Minister tell us, if she's listening to the questions, will the First Minister tell us, as a result of her budget choices and costly mistakes, how many teachers are going to lose their jobs in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I'll come on to uh, my government's budget choices in a moment, but let me issue, uh, with the case of respect to Douglas Ross, I'll, I'll answer Let's the questions. Let's hear the First Minister, please. Um, and I'll answer the questions uh, fully. But firstly, on the uh, general issue, I know, and we've seen this week, that Douglas Ross favours riding roughshod over the decisions and powers of democratically elected institutions. Members, I, on the other hand, members, thank you, respect the autonomy of democratically elected institutions. But to come to budget choices, let me set out the budget choices of this government. In this financial year, 2022-23, uh, uh, this government provided £145 million of additional funding to local authorities to employ up to 2,400 more teachers and 500 more classroom assistants. Uh, that funding, of course, is being protected in the budget that we have put forward for the next financial year. Um, and, of course, overall, we are increasing the resources available to councils by over £570 million. That's a real terms increase of £160.6 million. So there's the budget choices of this government, presiding officer. Uh, had we followed the advice, of course, of the Conservatives, we wouldn't be able to do all of that because we'd have cut taxes for the very richest people in the country. Douglas Ross. So first I asked Nicola Sturgeon about 800 teacher losses potentially happening in Glasgow. No answer. The next question was how many teachers fear losing their jobs across Scotland as a result of her government's budget? No answer again. And there are 900 fewer teachers in Scotland since Nicola Sturgeon's government came to power. That is the reality. But let's just look at quotes about the First Minister's budget. This is from SNP councillor Shona Morrison, the leader of the council umbrella group COSLA. SNP councillor 
Shona Morrison said this, the reality of this situation is that, yet again, the essential services councils deliver has not been prioritised by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government. That is the reality that councils and councillors, including SNP councillors, are facing across Scotland. But let's remember, more than six years ago, Nicola Sturgeon made bold promises eh, about education that it would be her number one priority. She claimed her government would close the attainment gap completely. But yesterday, her own education secretary rubbished Nicola Sturgeon's promise. Shirley Ann Somerville said, and this is a quote, I think in reality that is exceptionally difficult, if not impossible, to achieve, to get to the point of zero. So is the Education Secretary right that the First Minister's key promise is never going to happen? First Minister. Our commitment to substantially eliminate the poverty-related attainment uh, gap by 2026 still stands. I've said that in the Parliament uh, before and I say it again today. Although, let me uh, stress that phrase, poverty-related attainment gap. Of course, we are also trying to tackle child poverty uh, through something that I think Douglas Ross might have referred to as a pet project earlier on, uh, the Scottish Child Payment for example. Uh, and that task uh, of tackling child poverty and helping reduce uh, and substantially eliminate the poverty-related attainment gap uh, wouldn't be as difficult as it is if we didn't have a Tory government yeah. pushing more children into poverty every single week. Let's come back, presiding officer, to Thank you. teachers. Uh, the number of primary uh, teachers in our schools is amongst the highest today uh, than at any time since I was at primary school. Uh, the overall uh, uh, teacher-pupil ratio is the lowest in the UK. Um, and in Scotland, uh, right now, there are 7,573 teachers per 100,000 pupils. That compares to just 5,734, wow. where the Conservatives are in government wow. in England. And of course, as I said, we're providing £145 million Briefly, to, First Minister. to support additional teachers. So that's our funding choices, that's our record, and I am proud to stand on it. Douglas Ross. Nicola Sturgeon is proud to see SNP councils considering cutting teacher numbers. You're proud of that, First Minister. You should be embarrassed, if not disgraced. Nicola Sturgeon said, judge me on education. Well, the Education Secretary has done exactly that and found that the First Minister makes promises her governments won't meet. Her failures have left teachers frustrated, disappointed and angry. Today, schools in North Lanarkshire and Murray uh, are on strike. Tomorrow, it's Angus and Eastern Bartonshire. Next week, schools in another 10 council areas go on strike, including here in Edinburgh. The following week, another 10 are striking from Borders to Aberdeenshire. After years of disrupted education because of the COVID pandemic, when the Scottish Government was too quick to shut down schools and limit teaching time, pupils are once again getting a raw deal. Mm -hmm. All of this affects young people's opportunities and causes real problems for parents. So can the First Minister tell young people and Scottish families, will education ever be her number one priority? First Minister. Well, I'll let the people of Scotland continue to judge uh, the record and the actions and the decisions uh, of this uh, government. Uh, let me uh, repeat some of that. At a time when the Tories have been slashing, slashing budgets uh, for local councils, uh, this government in the budget we have put forward for next year is increasing council budgets uh, by over £570 million. Uh, we are providing £145 million to councils to support the employment of additional uh, teachers. Members. Again, let me repeat something we would not have been able to do had we followed Douglas Ross's yes, advice and cut taxes for the highest paid. Instead, we are asking uh, those at the top of the income spectrum in Scotland to pay a little bit more to protect yeah. our public services. And in terms uh, of pay dispute with teachers, uh, this is a government uh, that continues to negotiate and to seek uh, settlement. Again, that stands in marked contrast to where the Conservatives are in power, where the Education Secretary 
in England said this week uh, that we didn't negotiate pay with teachers because Briefly, that is First not Minister. what the government is here to do. Uh, the Tories, of course, are trying to take away the right to strike of public sector workers. We will continue uh, to seek fair pay deals in the NHS, Thank in you. the teaching profession and elsewhere across our public sector. We will continue to take decisions that prioritise education, that prioritise health, in stark Thank contrast you. to anything and everything the Scottish Conservatives do. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, last week we heard directly from frontline NHS staff who said that so many of the problems they are facing in acute care is because of the ongoing crisis in social care. Yesterday I met with frontline social care workers and their trade unions to discuss the state of the sector here in Scotland. They told me about the burnout experienced by their colleagues, their fears about the levels of care being offered and their inability to provide care to those who need it. The workers and experts were clear this is a problem over a decade in the making, a direct result of decisions made by this government. They told me that many of their colleagues have quit or retired early because of the pressures of the job, and they say the pay does not reward the hard work they do or reflect the importance of the role to society. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Um, I value uh, those who work in our social care sector and agree that the work they do has traditionally, not just in Scotland but in many places, been undervalued and that is what we are uh, seeking to change and to address. Uh, I also agree that some of uh, the pressures in acute and emergency uh, care and some of the pressures in our hospitals could be alleviated uh, by uh, reform and increasing further uh, the capacity in social care, which is why so much of uh, what we speak about is uh, directed at exactly uh, that. That's why just last week, for example, the Health Secretary announced additional funding uh, to secure additional interim uh, care home beds. Uh, £1.7 billion pounds has been provided for uh, social care and integration uh, in uh, the past uh, year. We are progressing our commitment to increase spend in social care by 25 per cent by the end of this parliament, which of course will be an increase of over £840 million. So we continue uh, to take these actions. In terms of uh, wages, we are providing £100 million of additional funding to uplift pay from April uh, this year, having already uh, increased it uh, so far, and we will continue to do that so that our social care workforce uh, do get the value uh, not just in our rhetoric, uh, but in their pay packets that they so richly deserve. Anna Sarwar. It's important to note that the proposals outlined by the First Minister there have widely been criticised by frontline staff as being nowhere near enough to meet the demands of the crisis we face. Now, the First Minister should not ignore the facts. They will be paying £10.90 an hour to social care staff, which represents a 3.8 per cent pay increase, that is 40p, at a time when inflation is running at 9 per cent and when NHS staff are being offered an average of 7.5 per cent. This in the context of a First Minister who said they would reward social care staff who put their lives on the line to get us through the pandemic. But 40 pence more in the midst of a cost of living crisis does not feel like much of a reward to these workers, and it is not going to address the ongoing workforce crisis. So why can't the First Minister see there is no solution to the NHS crisis without a solution to the social care crisis? 71 per cent of care at home services are reporting vacancies, and 75 per cent of care homes are reporting vacancies. We heard yesterday the staff are leaving to work in Sainsbury's, Costa and Lidl because they are getting better pay and better conditions. So will the First Minister finally commit to an immediate pay increase to £12 an hour, rising to £15 for social care workers across Scotland? First Minister. Well, look, these, these are serious issues and we take them uh, seriously, but it's important that we can fund the decisions we take. So, uh, first of all, the £10.90 per hour that Anna Sarwar uh, derides, it's important to point out, just as an aside, uh, that, that is the rate paid uh, by the Labour government in Wales to the social care uh, workforce. In terms of uh, pay increases, over the past two years, there has been a 14.7% increase for 
uh, social care workers. Uh, pay has uh, increased from £9.50 per hour in April 2021 to £10.90, uh, £10 which it will become in April uh, this year. For a full-time adult social care uh, worker, that increase represents an uplift of over £780 over the course of this financial year. Uh, I want us to go further, uh, and we intend to go further, uh, but we have to be able to fund that. To increase pay to £15 per hour for all social care workers, as Labour is asking us to do, um, and I understand why people want to see that happen, would cost up to an additional £1.75 billion. Pounds. Now, Labour hasn't set out how Briefly, they would please, fund First Minister. that or what they would propose to cut as a consequence. So, yes, uh, we want to see pay increase further, but we have to do that in a properly funded way. That is responsible government. Anna Sarwar. I'll tell the First Minister what's derisory. Derisory is giving a 3.8% pay increase to workers we say are on the front line when inflation is running at 9%. That's what's derisory and causing the social care crisis. Now, the First Minister asks where the money is coming from. This government's failure to eliminate delayed discharge is costing at least £150 million a year. And their National Care Service is estimated to cost £1.3 billion, money spent on setup and administration that should be spent on frontline services to address the current crisis. Organisations who, like Scottish Labour, support a National Care Service are calling for the SNP to pause the bill. Organisations like the GMB, Unison, Unite, Social Work Scotland, Scottish Care, COSLA and the STUC. And this is what the GMB told this Parliament. Social care staff are broken. They are exhausted. Now we're giving them a bill that doesn't give them any sort of job security, any sort of value or feeling of worth. We want reform. We want to make social care better. But we feel they're being offered now is nowhere near good enough. So will the First Minister finally listen to workers on the front line, pause this flawed bill and put the money where it needs to be so we can actually confront the NHS and social care crisis? First Minister. Well, first of all, Parliament is currently scrutinising uh, the bill and that process of scrutiny is important. But fair work and sectoral bargaining are actually at the very heart of these uh, reform proposals. But can I also say to Anna Sarwar uh, that calling uh, for uh, a reform that is due to be implemented in future years in order to fund a pay increase in yeah. this financial year yeah. is just an example of the completely irresponsible and incoherent approach Labour yeah, takes to budgeting. Yeah. That's not how budgeting uh, works. So, uh, by all means, let's continue to scrutinise the National Care Service legislation, uh, but don't mislead yeah. people yeah. into thinking that if we just stopped that bill, then suddenly we would free up money yeah. now uh, for pay increases. It simply doesn't work that way. Uh, let me repeat uh, the actions that we have taken. Uh, a 14.7 per cent increase for uh, social care workers in the past uh, two years, uh, and we want to go uh, further. And of course, for NHS uh, workers, they offer this year 7.5 per cent on average, compared to 4.5 per cent where Labour is in government uh, in these islands. Uh, so our actions uh, demonstrate the value we have for these workers. And within uh, the budget that we have, we will continue to prioritise that. But we will do that in a responsible and a deliverable way, uh, which puts us in stark contrast to Labour. Question number three, Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government has taken to bring the strike action by teachers to an end. First Minister. Well, as I think uh, we have demonstrated, not least in the NHS, uh, we are... We will briefly suspend business.
Thank you. We'll go back to question number three, and I would ask Mr Kerr if you would repeat your initial question, Mr Kerr. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government has taken to bring the strike action by teachers to an end. First Minister. Well, as I think we have demonstrated, not least in the National Health Service, uh, this is a government that values public sector workers and seeks to negotiate fair pay deals. Uh, to that end, we continue to work closely with trade unions and local government partners uh, to reach uh, a deal that is fair and affordable. Uh, that dialogue has been constructive. Uh, there does still remain a gap uh, between the union asks and, to be blunt, what is affordable within our finite resources, and therefore uh, we look for further compromise. The Education Secretary is in regular dialogue with the unions uh, and with COSLA, has spoken individually with each of the union general secretaries to progress things within the past week. Uh, there were two meetings of the SNCT negotiators last week and another one scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, there is a shared commitment uh, and certainly it's a commitment of this government to reach uh, an agreement as soon as possible. Stephen Kerr. Well, last week, the First Minister, talking about Hamza Yusuf, said something about how there hadn't been any strikes because she thinks he's so brilliant. And then in contrast, in education, we have Shirley Ann Somerville, the first teacher strike in 40 years. Chaos for hundreds of thousands of parents and carers and pupils. The Cabinet Secretary shows no energy, no urgency to get involved and to resolve the teacher strike. That's not just my view, that's the view of the unions. The First Minister used to say that education was her top priority. Will she step in and end the strike? First Minister. Yeah, as teacher strikes loom in England, the hypocrisy of the Tories is absolutely staggering. Shelly Ann Somerville will continue uh, to do everything possible to reach an agreement uh, with COSA and our teaching unions to deliver uh, a fair pay increase for teachers. Over the past few years, teachers uh, have already had a 21% pay increase, demonstrating uh, the value we attach to what they do. Teachers uh, in Scotland, I think, are the highest paid on average uh, of any of the teaching professions across the UK. So we will continue to seek a fair settlement. But the hypocrisy uh, really is uh, staggering because Stephen Kerr uh, talks about the efforts Shirley Ann Somerville is making, uh, and she is making strenuous efforts. Uh, the Tory Education Secretary in England, uh, just in the last few days, said this, uh, that we didn't negotiate pay with teaching unions because that is not what we are here to do. So in Scotland, the demand that the Education Secretary resolves it, uh, in England, of course, the Tories simply wash their hands and dig their heels in because they don't value public sector workers. They want to take away the right to strike of public sector workers. This government does value all of our public sector workers. Question number four, Stephanie Callaghan. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report Closing the Accountability Gap, published by the National Autistic Society Scotland. First. Uh, we welcome the survey by the National Autistic Society and Scottish Autism. It adds to the diverse range of views we have from autistic people, people with a learning disability and other neurodivergent groups uh, on a learning disability, autism and neurodiversity commissioner. The survey highlights areas where autistic people feel they need better support, including around mental health and education. Uh, we have recognised the need for additional work on mental health and have been working closely with autistic adults and adults with a learning disability on this. We're committed to bringing forward a consultation later this year on the learning disability, autism and neurodiversity bill, including the creation of a commissioner. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the First Minister for her answer. The National Autistic Society and Scottish Autism surveyed over 1,200 autistic people, families and professionals, and 96% of them did support the creation, and it would be a world first of a Scottish Commissioner for autistic people and learning disabled people. Does the First Minister agree that while we already have sound laws and strategies in place, we really do need that focus of a Commissioner to champion, promote and protect the rights of people in these groups and to ensure that individuals are supported to reach their full potential? 
First Minister. Yes, I do agree with that. The Learning Disability, Autism and Neurodiversity Bill will extend further than autism and include people with a learning disability and potentially a wider range of neurodivergent conditions. However, from our scoping work with a range of stakeholders, we understand that even within the autism community, there are a range of views on how this is best taken forward, which is why we're establishing a lived experience panel to work closely uh, with us to co-design key elements of the Bill's development. This will include delivering a consultation paper later this year to provide an opportunity for people across Scotland to express their views, including on the potential role and duties of a commissioner. Question number five, Sue Webber. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government has made, including the reported backlog of people waiting for key diagnostic tests. First Minister. There is a range of work being taken forward by NHS boards to increase capacity, workforce and activity for diagnostics, including the use of seven uh, mobile MRI and five mobile CT scanners to provide additional activity. I am conscious that the Conservatives claimed this weekend that there were five-year waits for diagnostic tests. They described that as and I'm quoting, scarcely believable. Uh, there is, of course, a reason for that, uh, and that is because it was simply untrue. Uh, NHS Grampian have pointed out that the Tories have misrepresented data they received in an FOI response. It is routine for patients who have been treated for forms of cancer or received neurosurgical care to have pre-planned and scheduled scans in future years to monitor their progress and condition after treatment. Uh, these are not diagnostic tests prior to treatment, as the Conservatives claimed. Clearly, our NHS is wrestling with a number of very significant pressures right now, but it does no service to anyone for the Conservatives to distort figures and mislead the public. Sue Weber. Uh, thank you, First Minister. One Health Board has taken the decision to reduce its endoscopic capacity by 3,500 procedures over the next 12 months. This means there are 35 people living with undiagnosed cancer. Because of these Scottish Government cuts, rather than being able to increase their diagnostic endoscopic services to meet the demands, they are being forced to cut the service. How can the backlog be cleared when the diagnostic services are being cut? First Minister. Uh, there are no cuts uh, to National Health Service budgets. On the contrary, we are proposing a £1 billion increase to the budget of the National Health Service uh, next year. Again, something that wouldn't have been possible had we taken Tory advice to cut taxes for the richest people in our society. And uh, within that, capacity for diagnostic tests is being uh, increase because everybody recognises that the earliest uh, possible diagnosis, especially uh, for cancer, is vital. Uh, so we continue to build up uh, capacity and continue to support the NHS to fully recover from COVID. Jackie Bailey. A woman in my constituency has waited a year since her initial smear test, which reported an abnormality, to receive an appointment for a follow-up colposcopy. The appointments offered to her in December and then January have now both been cancelled. And she is not alone, because waiting times for colposcopies are going up, not down, and women's health is at risk. Will the First Minister prioritise action on women's health and ensure that women are not put through the emotional turmoil of having to wait a minute longer than they need for urgent diagnostic tests? First Minister. Uh, people who need urgent tests are uh, seen quickly. Often individual cases are, are rightly raised with me in the chamber. I'm not saying uh, this is the case here with the uh, the incident that Jackie Bailey has narrated, but sometimes uh, I can go into individual case details, obviously, but sometimes uh, there is more complexity to these cases than is often uh, put before uh, the Chamber. But I, that is why I always say I am happy to look into individual cases. Uh, there is significant investment in capacity uh, for diagnostic tests and for any follow-up uh, required as a result of these. That is uh, particularly important around a range of women's health uh, conditions and we do prioritise women's health and indeed uh, shortly the report on our women's health plan uh, will be published along with uh, progress in appointing a women's health uh, champion. So these issues uh, are of priority and will continue to be so. Question number six, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to encourage people to become foster carers following reports that only 40 of 400 children referred to Bernardo's fostering service in Glasgow and Edinburgh have been placed with families in the last year. 
First Minister. As part of keeping the promise, we are committed to ensuring that children and young people who are looked after away from their own families and homes are provided with caring and loving foster families. Although responsibility for recruiting sufficient foster carers lies with local authorities, uh, we are aware that the pandemic and cost of living crisis has put uh, additional pressure on foster carer capacity. Uh, that is compounded uh, by some of the wider pressures facing the social work uh, sector, of course, and we are determined to address this. Uh, that is why we are working with key national and local partners, including the third sector, to identify action we can take collectively now and in the future to improve the situation. The Scottish Government also provides £145,000 each year to the fostering network to raise the profile of foster caring and encourage the recruitment of new carers, as well as providing wider advice and support. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that response and her continued commitment to the promise. Unfortunately, 691 children and young people are waiting for foster care, up from 461 in 12 months. Many Scots have welcomed Ukrainian families fleeing war over the last year, partly due to Scotland's call for a volunteers campaign. Will the First Minister consider launching a renewed drive to encourage more potential foster carers to come forward and help ensure that children and young people waiting to be fostered can be placed in safe, stable and loving homes as soon as possible? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will give consideration to that. Uh, let me take the opportunity to thank uh, all the people and families who have opened up their home to Ukrainian families over uh, the past months. That is testimony to the welcoming nature of uh, people who call Scotland home. Uh, there are, of course, very important differences between supporting Ukrainian families and fostering children uh, who may have very complex need uh, and require day-to-day -day caregiving, uh, including, for example, supporting contact with their birth families. Uh, however, I would encourage anyone thinking about fostering to speak to their local authority or a fostering organisation. Uh, Fostering brings great benefits uh, to children, obviously, and that is the most important consideration, uh, but also to foster families. Um, and certainly we will consider all options which may have the potential to improve the lives of children with care experience. Uh, and I will ask officials to work with stakeholders and caregivers to consider the possibility of a national communications campaign and its potential to help recruit more foster carers. Thank you. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Fulton McGregor. Um, thank you, President Officer. A report from Nourish Scotland has reportedly uncovered a dignity gap relating to the cost of living crisis for Scotland's most hard-pressed families. The research explains how many families have been compelled to select the cheapest food and drink available rather than the products they would prefer to choose but can't afford, which is described as a dignity gap. Does the First Minister share my view that it is disgraceful that families living in a country of such abundant wealth are forced to make such sacrifices? First Minister. Um, yes, I do share those concerns. The cost of living crisis is, of course, affecting uh, everyone, but it, has, it is having a disproportionate effect uh, on those already living in poverty. That is why the Government is taking the range of action that we are taking here, including, for example, the Scottish Child Payment. But I would call on the UK Government to provide more help to those most in need and to do so urgently. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have been raising the case of Ellie Wilson, who became a victim of rape while studying at Glasgow University. Ellie survived this ordeal, but she was shocked to discover that the perpetrator had been allowed to transfer to another university, despite being under investigation for rape at the time. And it has since been discovered that there is no national guidance for how universities should deal with sexual assault cases. Will the First Minister agree to sort this urgently so that no other victim has to suffer this ordeal? First Minister. Well, obviously, I am aware uh, of this case and its uh, extremely serious uh, implications, and we do take all of that serious and will give consideration to any further action that the Government uh, needs to take to address uh, some of the issues uh, raised here. EMILY's test, of course, is an important initiative that the uh, government worked with universities on uh, and encourage uh, universities to take very seriously, but there are clearly uh, serious issues raised here that we need to reflect further on, and I can give an assurance that the government will do so. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. The publication of the Health Foundation's report this week is grim reading. 
It lays bare the extent of health inequalities across Scotland, from a growing gap in life expectancy between the richest and the poorest, to a widening gap in infant mortality between the advantaged and disadvantaged. It is a similar story across the UK, but it is one that is amplified in Scotland. These chasms have widened while we have had 13 years of Tory government, but it is a reflection on the SNP government that Scotland's inequalities remain greater. Can the First Minister respond to the Health Foundation's comments that understanding the causes is not enough, a radical shift in approach is needed, and without action, Scotland's most deprived communities are likely to continue suffering from poor quality of life and die younger? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do ag ag agree with that, and I uh, agree with those comments of the Health Foundation. Uh, these are not new or even recent challenges in Scotland, but it is vital that we uh, do more and as much as possible to tackle them. Uh, tackling health inequalities is a major concern for governments and communities uh, right across uh, the world, and Scotland faces the same challenges uh, as many other countries. Uh, but it is important that we act in a preventative way as much as possible, which is why the government is doing so much, as much as we can, within our powers and resources to tackle poverty, because that, of course, is the route uh, to tackling health uh, and other inequalities. So we will continue to take a range of actions and call on the UK Government to step up as well. Willie Rennie. Uh, last evening, I watched a social media vi video of one female pupil attacking another at Wade Academy in my constituency. To be frank, I wish I hadn't. I can't get it out of my head. It was an ugly scene. Earlier this year, Heather Hughes, the then president of the EIS, warned about increasing violence in our schools. I'm supporting staff, the council and the school locally, but what action is the government taking across the country? First Minister. Can I thank Willie Rennie for raising uh, this issue? I have not uh, seen the, the video that he raises here today, although I, I will uh, watch it if it is available, because I think it is important that we uh, do have a, a full understanding of issues like this. Violence is never acceptable, uh, and the safety of pupils and staff is paramount. Obviously, I can't comment further today on the specifics of the case at Wade Academy, but I am very clear that violence towards anyone is unacceptable. Um, I asked the Education Secretary to meet uh, with the COSLA spokesperson for children and young people to discuss what further support to local authorities is required and what further support we can provide. They met on the 2nd of December and discussed a continued commitment to work together in partnership through the Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships and Behaviour in Schools and to use the Behaviour in Scottish Schools research as the national evidence base to inform future policy um, on relationships and behaviour in school. We're also investing an additional £50 million this year to enhance capacity in education authorities and schools uh, to respond effectively to the needs of children and young people. So we will continue uh, to consider fully what additional steps we can take to support councils in making it very clear that violence is unacceptable and taking action to support children, uh, young people and uh, teachers who may face such violence. Natalie Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. Research from the Work Foundation at Lancaster University has found that unless delayed or amended, the UK Government's retained EU law bill will put the rights and protection of more than 8.6 million UK workers at risk, with women accounting for around 6 million of those who will be most affected. Can the First Minister advise what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the impact which this bill will have on workers in Scotland, and in particular women in the Scottish workforce, and can she provide any information about what assessment has been made as to the impact which this bill could have on devolved responsibilities? First Minister. Well, Natalie Dawn is right to raise this issue. Uh, the bill risks damaging a range of sectors. Um, including protections uh, for workers gained over 40 years of EU membership. Uh, Unison describe it as, and I'm quoting, an attack on working women, uh, and indeed the fact that the bill was promoted uh, previously by Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, when he was in government and is supported by hard Brexiteers, I think is evidence of the race to the bottom ideology that lies behind these proposals. Uh, this parliament, of course, has called for the bill to be scrapped, and if the UK government had any respect for devolution, which I think is now obvious it doesn't, uh, that is exactly what would happen. If this bill proceeds, and we will continue to argue against it as hard as we can. Uh, we will do everything possible to limit the damage to Scotland. Uh, but of course, by giving UK ministers the power to legislate in devolved uh, matters uh, without 
about the consent of this chamber, it is yet another example of the growing threat and the very, very real threat this UK Government now poses uh, to the Scottish Parliament. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Uh, 18 months ago, I asked Nicola Sturgeon about the malicious prosecution of innocent men in Scotland. Taxpayers have been hit with a £24 million compensation bill. Today, that figure has risen to more than double, £51 million, with every penny taken from frontline services. Now, a police officer who abused his power has resigned. A sheriff who abused his power will also resign. The First Minister and her Justice Secretary have gone silent on a scandal that contaminates Scottish justice. And I would like to ask Nicola Sturgeon, what does it take for anyone to be held to account in SNP-run Scotland? First Minister. I think uh, Russell Finlay kind of exposed the motive behind this question in his last uh, few words yes. there. Um, these, of course, are issues that flow that flow from uh, decisions taken independently uh, by the Crown Office, and the Crown Office is independent on all decisions relating to prosecutions. Uh, there have been court proceedings uh, live on these issues, and of course uh, ministers can't comment while court proceedings are live, and the Tories would be amongst the first to criticise us yeah. if we did. Uh, and there is also, of course, a commitment uh, to a full inquiry into all of this as soon as it is possible uh, to do that, uh, in order that there can be full scrutiny uh, and, where appropriate, full accountability. Pam Duncan Clancy. Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, I met with a group of people from Partick Thistle Community Trust's Accepting Activity Programme in Parliament. They support homeless people, refugees, and asylum seekers, and people living with mental ill health every day. They told me that the project has been a lifeline, and to quote their late friend, they said, It is often the reason they believe in the goodness of others. They also told me that they're facing unprecedented costs for their energy costs and worried they will no longer be able to provide the support they do without further support. So I ask whether there is anything the First Minister can do and whether she'd work with me to help them. First Minister. Um, I understand this issue was raised with the Cabinet Secretary uh, earlier this week or even today um, at committee and she has undertaken to look into the issue and to write uh, to the member. So I would suggest that is the appropriate way uh, for now to proceed. Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, President Officer. Um, First Minister, this month marks the 30th anniversary of Celtic Connections. Can I ask from one Glasgow MSP to another if you will welcome this landmark anniversary of a Scottish cultural gem and great contribution to Glasgow City's economy, and will you be going along yourself to enjoy it jig time? First Minister. Well, I'll be going along. Um, if, if I get the opportunity, I, I will certainly relish it. But as a citizen of the, the great city of Glasgow uh, myself, I am very pleased that Celtic Connections is back for its first full live run uh, since 2020, showcasing 2,100 musicians from around the world at more than 300 events across multiple genres of music. Uh, I'm delighted that the Scottish Government continues to support the festival through our Expo Fund. Uh, and let me take the opportunity to congratulate Celtic Connections on the 30th anniversary of a festival that has grown to become a cornerstone in Scotland's annual cultural calendar uh, and that continues to raise Glasgow's profile worldwide as an exciting, cosmopolitan, welcoming city. I do hope I get the opportunity to sample some of its delights uh, this year, uh, but I was, uh, I believe, uh, at some events in its founding year 30 years ago, which perhaps says something about my age that I would rather le have left unsaid. <laughs> Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Around lunchtime last Saturday, a car smashed into a property just off the A90 near Dundee. It's a road that just about every driver in Scotland will travel on at some point, and this was the tenth crash at the same spot in just six years, according to the courier. The owners of the property live in fear their grandchildren out playing in the garden could be seriously injured or even killed. I raised this issue two years ago, but no remedial action has taken place. So will the First Minister now treat this as a matter of urgency? First Minister. Well, obviously the uh, crash uh, last weekend uh, was extremely uh, serious and my thoughts 
of course, are with all who were involved in that. Uh, it's important that any appropriate investigations into uh, that are allowed to take their course uh, and that we reflect on the findings of any of that. When we've had the opportunity to do that, I will undertake to have the Transport Minister write directly uh, to the member with any further steps that require to be taken. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Liam Kerr. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, the 15th of November, in relation to the misleading claim that Scotland had 25% of offshore wind potential, I asked Minister Lorna Slater, when did ministers first become aware that they were using a figure that hadn't been properly sourced? She responded, ministers became aware of the issue on Tuesday, the 8th of November. On Thursday, the 17th of November, I raised a point of order that Minister Slater appeared to have mis misled Parliament in her assertion, and I reminded her of the Ministerial Code at Section 1.3c, which requires the correcting of the record. I stated... Mr Kerr, if you could just give me a moment, can I ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so quietly? <laughs> and can I ask members who are conducting a conversation in the chamber to please conduct such conversations elsewhere? Thank you. Mr Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful, President Officer, and I'm uh, slightly stunned to see the Minister in question actually leaving the Chamber as I'm speaking. But I stated at the time, 17th of November, that the utter disregard by certain Ministers in not abiding by the processes and codes risks bringing this Parliament into disrepute and risks undermining your position as Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the record remains uncorrected by Minister Slater, or indeed, to the best of my knowledge, any of the other ministers who have deployed the statistic. Now, Presiding Officer, last Monday, 16th of January, Minister Michael Matheson was asked at the Scottish Affairs Committee in relation to the claim that Scotland had 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential when he became aware that the figure was inaccurate. He said, if I recall correctly, sometime back in September. Presiding officer, both statements cannot simultaneously be true. Either Ms Slater has misled this place or Mr Matheson has misled the House of Commons. Presiding officer, since ignoring and disrespecting the ministerial code is clearly endemic amongst this government and none of them feel any obligation to do anything about it or indeed listen to points of order, I wonder if you might request that Minister Slater appear before this Parliament to give a statement as to why she apparently misled Parliament, why she and her colleagues feel it unnecessary to abide by our codes, and perhaps, finally, to give an honest and accurate answer to my original question. I thank the member for his point of order. Um, as the member will be aware, I've dealt with related matters before, and I will repeat that matters in relation to the Ministerial Code are a matter for the Scottish Government. The Parliament, as all members know, has a corrections mechanism which enables any member to request a correction to any factual inaccuracy that may have been contained in a contribution during our proceedings. And as a matter of courtesy and respect, I do expect that all members should be accurate in their contributions and should seek to remedy any factual inaccuracies whether through the corrections mechanism or other methods, at the earliest possible opportunity. But all members, all members, we will suspend the meeting briefly.
Thank you. Um, we, will, we will resume. Um, all members are aware that it is not the role of the presiding officer to make rulings on the accuracy of contributions. Rather, it is a matter for each member as to whether they consider their contributions to have been accurate. But if a member is dissatisfied with information that has been provided to the Minister, it remains open to them to pursue this issue through all the avenues that are available to members. And, um, Mr Kerr asked if I could call the Minister to make a, a statement to the Chamber. That is not something that is within my power, but the member in seeking a ministerial statement we may wish to raise this matter with their business manager who can raise it in the Bureau. We will now move on to point of order Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do not do this lightly, and I realise that there have been some delay getting to this point. However, Presiding Officer, in response to my topical question on the 6th of December last year, the Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise, Ivan McKee, assured this Parliament that the budget and completion timescales for vessels 801 and 802 were on target. Now, Presiding Officer, I visited the shipyard just four days prior to asking that question and met with the Chief Executive. He was clear the budget would be exceeded and that 802 would not be delivered on time. I have the notes of my visits available should they, these be required. Ivan McKee's answers to my topical questions baffled me as it appeared that it was more than a political non-answer which we can often expect. Subsequent FOIs reveal email exchanges between CMAL and Ferguson Marine showing that they both knew of the problems prior to my questions being asked. So that begs the question, was the Minister aware before he answered my topical question that there were indeed further delays and expenses relating to hulls 801 and 802? Presiding officer, through an FOI, I obtained Ivan McKee's briefing notes. Mr Mountain, might I ask what your point of order is? Um, I am coming to the, the point of order, presiding officer, if I can just finish this sentence and, and if I may then come back to it. Presiding officer, I obtained through the FOI Ivan McKee's briefing notes that were prepared by his staff in order to allow him to answer my questions. And I can only assume he read those. And it was clear in those briefing notes that he was aware of the delay to 801, 802 and the extension to the cost of the budget. Now, presiding officer, I know it is disrespectful and unacceptable to suggest somebody has lied or misled the Parliament, so I will not. But it is clear and unambiguous evidence that I have got here that his response was at best a misrepresentation of the facts or worse, worse, plainly untruthful. Therefore, Presiding Officer, I seek your guidance on how members of this Parliament can hold the Government to account if it takes numerous FOIs to prove that a Minister has clearly been uneconomical with the truth. I think all members will be aware that a point of order takes precedence where a member has, con has concerns that um, proceedings have not taken place in a, in a proper way. Um, with regards to the points the member raises, these are not points that I can rule on from the chair. I have just addressed a point of order regarding accuracy of members' contributions in the chamber, and I would again have to point the member to the many avenues that exist for, me for members to pursue um, one another on issues where they are dissatisfied with a response. We will now move on. Oh, point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, on the basis of what you just said, I'll withdraw my point of order on this occasion. Thank you. We will now move on to members' business. I'll allow a moment to, for the gallery to clear.